Well, today as I begin my sermon, you know, I have the opportunity to give a sermon today. Uh, two weeks ago, I gave the subject of who's looking out for you. Last week, I gave the subject of looking out for other people. And by the way, for those guests who are here for the first time, a copy of those two handouts are also in the back if you want to take those home with you. If those of you who are here remember at the conclusion of last week's sermon about looking out for other people, I mentioned a sermon I'd given back in 2012 entitled, Are You Helping Other People to Carry Their Cross? And as it turns out, what happens is a lot of times, most of us who prepare, we have too much material. And a lot of times what we do is we trim while we speak and we don't cover everything on our handout or cover everything in our notes. And so I certainly rushed through the last part of last week's sermon. I think I had about seven minutes to cover it, and I didn't like it, the fact that I only took seven minutes to cover it. So I thought I'll come back again and cover it in a longer period of time. The title of this sermon is, Continue to Help People to Carry Their Cross. Continue to Help People to Carry Their Cross. I'm, I'm going to, it's a long, I know a long title. My little subtitles are real short. The first point is Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Helping people carry their cross. You know, because that's something I think deserves a lot of attention and could be covered in many ways, many sermons, many times. But again, since we talked about carrying crosses and pe- people carry, helping people carry crosses, I want to spend a little more time on that. Because, friends, I think a lot of you are doing that. And I want you to continue doing that. Because I think which your actions are very pleasing to God. For those who are ch- coming in today, you can always look at those sermons later on, the, the previous sermons. And hopefully then, if this is a new concept to you, I hope you will embrace the concept. And I hope you will help people carry their cross. See, look to chapter 14, verse 27. I'm going to read it first out of context, and then we'll read it in context. Verse 27 says, By the way, I think I'll be reading probably, if everything goes right, about 10 sections of Scripture. And you say, why only 10? Because that way, those, that amount, you and I could read along together, and it's, it's not too much. If I try to read 30 Scriptures with you, I'll go way over time. So I, I envision to go 10 sections of Scripture. Hopefully I can make it work. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So it's very important. <clears throat> Disciples are taught to carry their cross. <clears throat> now let's read it in context. Jesus talking, the Son of God talking from verses 26 to 33. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. I, I don't like the translation of hate, you know, hating your parents or hating your kids. I certainly, I'd, I'd like the positive approach is you, you must love God more. You must like Christ more. You must put him first. You must put them first. I mean, unfortunately, the word hate just has bad connotations. But I understand how it's used, but I just prefer, I wish it had been something, I wish it were something different than that. <clears throat> Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So he gives two kind of qualities here of putting God first and carrying this cross. He goes on to talk about counting the cost. It's like, which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether you have enough money to finish it? Because if you just build a foundation and don't finish it, people might mock you. You know, that happens if you start a project and the project doesn't get done, you can be mocked. I hope that, husbands, I hope you're not starting projects that your wife's, your wife mocks you about. Wives, I hope you're not starting projects that your husband mocks you about. We really shouldn't mock each other, but when you don't finish projects, you, we open ourselves up to mocking. Because they can say, this man began to build, but he didn't finish. And then what about a king who goes to war against another king? Doesn't he sit down to think about, will my 10,000 people beat their 20,000 people? By the way, I have a weird thing I'm doing in this time of pandemic. I've been watching a lot of World War II documentaries. I've been watching a lot of history. You might say, that's negative. It most certainly is negative. 
And the part of the reason is I want to look at what a real crisis is and how our nation dealt with a real crisis as opposed to we we have some challenges today. Don't get me wrong. There are definitely challenges today. But my opinion, I think our country has overreacted to a crisis or to a, a situation. And so I've been watching a lot of history about the Germany and the Soviet Union and World War, how World War II began, uh, how Hiroshima came about, the, the choice that Truman had to make, <clears throat> and to watch how they had to, as gener- generals, they should have sat down and decided, can I do this? Can I, can I do this job? <clears throat> That's what kings do. <clears throat> That's what leaders do. Excuse me. I hope that frog doesn't stay there the whole time. Excuse me again. Also then, uh, verse 32, if you don't have enough troops to win, you should should go for peace. That's what verse 32 says. If you size it up saying, uh, should I do this or not? I don't think I can win this. What terms of peace can I get? That applies to nations. That applies to debates. That applies to fighting. That applies to marriage. I mean, if you're going to get into a war with your spouse, you better size it up. Is it worth the battle with your spouse? Is it really worth it? What are you going to gain from saying those words? What are you going to gain from doing that action? Is it just stubbornness? Is it just, I have to do it, lack of self-control? What are you going to gain? The whole principle, count the cost. So whether it's a war, whether it's a nation, whether it's a business, should we start up a business? Is is there enough, are there enough customers out there to start up the business? And of course, there's going to be a lot of that going on, a lot of discussion of that going on as businesses try to reestablish themselves. Then he says, verse 33, so likewise, whoever you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to carry your own cross. Now, on the handout, I put down some different translations about what that means, verse 27. The Moffat translation, they all say similar. There's nothing, there's nothing mystical here. Moffat translation says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, he cannot be a disciple of mine. The Revised Standard says, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The New American Standard, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And again, some of you may notice that those are older, trans, older Bible translations. Some of you may have some newer Bible translations. I generally stick with the translations that have been successful for me through the years. Sometimes people will look at a translation and say, this translation makes things easier. Well, that's good. It has its place. But I'm more concerned about being accurate. And so thereby, I tend, as an old person who's 67... I tend to rely on the older translations that I, I feel more comfortable with. I think some of the newer translations can be easier reading, but they may not be as accurate. So I, I'm just giving you my point of reference. My point of reference, if you see when I look diff, different translations, you'll notice I'm picking the older ones. I also have a valuable book I can't find. I'm sure you can Google it. Dixon can find it somewhere on the Internet. The New Testament in 26 Translations, a great book. I have that one. And uh, I, I looked at that one, and so it pointed out uh, one place says, t- uh, Good Speed Translation says, Take up his own cross. Uh, the New Testament, a translation in the language of the people by William says, Persevere in carrying the cross. The Four Gospels by uh, this guy says, Shoulder his cross. So there's really nothing mystical or hard to understand about verse 27. You have to be willing to, in the analogy, to carry your cross if you want to be a disciple. Now, let's turn to Genesis chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Scriptures that in churches, churches of God years ago were read almost every week, and now we don't read them a lot. But I I do want to refer to them today, even though you're very familiar with Genesis chapter 3. Carry your own cross. One of the meanings of carry your own cross is don't blame other people. Do not blame other people. If you're willing to carry your cross, Christ is saying, now don't blame others. Don't put the responsibility back on others. If, if, you, if you do something, don't say, well, my spouse made me do it, or my friend made me do it, or my church made me do it, or my pastor made me do it, 
Well, my friend made me do it. Don't do that. Carrying your own cross means you're taking personal responsibility. This congregation is noted for, as many other congregations, especially our sister congregations, is noted for we avoid groupthink, meaning if something I, any, anything I say today would you think is right, you agree with. If you think I'm wrong about something, you don't agree with it because that's the way I look, would look at Mr. Skelton and every one of our speakers, any one of our guest speakers, any one of our regular speakers. We don't believe in group think. We want people to come up here and make their case, use the scripture, use, so use good sound biblical study, hopefully use some good logic, and make the case. And we expect all of the people who hear this in the hall here and on the Internet to use your, main, your brains, to use your logic, to use your spiritual discernment and your relationship with God to find what you can in our messages and put it into practice. Now, we're not the only ones who do that. I'm, I'm sure there are others who do that, but I'm just confirming that is our goal. That is our goal. We don't want to blame other people for what we do. I am not going to blame you for my decisions. And if you try to blame me for your decisions, it's not going to go anywhere with God. You cannot, we cannot be blaming each other. Genesis 3 verse 12 says, I'm going to find it over here. At the Garden of Eden story, when God said, who told you you were naked? Verse 12, the man said, the woman that you gave me. Now, who is he blaming, the woman or God? It's, it could be, it's a choice. He's blaming the woman, but he's also blaming God. Well, you gave her to me, so you're kind of at fault too. The woman you gave me, she told me the eat of the tree, and I did it. So again, it's not we are not to be in a position of, of uh, blaming our wife. Now the wife, verse 13, the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and that's why I ate. The serpent deceived me. So both of them, Adam and Eve, both blamed and so we can blame other people. And sometimes we can even blame the devil. I'm not saying the devil's a, a, a lacking of responsibility. He certainly influences us. But you know, as bad of an influence as he is on us, and he's a bad influence on us, we really can't even blame him. God says, I've, I've told you about him. I've showed you what he's like. I've warned you about him. And I've given you the tools to overcome him. So yes, you can recognize him as a bad influence, but you know what? You've got to take responsibility for what you do. So when you carry the cross, we don't blame people. We can't blame, we can't blame the country. We can't blame other countries. We can't blame government. We can't blame the, 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 the Congress. Yes, they make their decisions that influence us, but how are we taking responsibility of how are we dealing with all this? What are we doing about it? What choices are we making? Let's go over to the next verse, over in Exodus chapter 32. I love this one. I, I love this one. It's not a good example, but it's an example that really makes the point. This is the example of Aaron. Now, if you know Exodus chapter 32, talks about the time they made the golden calf, which is a very famous st story. In fact, the story is quoted in the New Testament in a couple of places. But, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole story of how they made the golden calf while Moses was gone. But what's interesting is Aaron's response, because Aaron blamed. He's, he's blaming like a teenager blames. He's blaming like sometimes in the church of God today, people will blame. In fact, I don't know, maybe you blame this badly, but probably many of you don't blame this badly. But if you do, you repent of it, just like he had to repent of it. So he was involved with building the calf, remember? So in Exodus chapter 32, verse 22, Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. God, don't get too mad at me. Don't get too angry at me. Don't get too angry. You know the people that they're set on evil. Okay, he's already deflecting to the people. Yeah, but Aaron, what did you do? Well, you know the people, are they think bad things. And quite frankly, they could have been a bad influence. They pressured him. But he cracked under the pressure. And that's what's so sad today. I have to tell you this. I have to tell you this. The pandemic, what it's revealed to me, it's revealed a lot of things to me, 
how easily people are swayed by what other people say or do. And there's a lot of debates going on. People will give their view of science and people give another view of science and they conflict, they butt heads. And so when people say science is the only thing that solves it, no, there's got to be also logic involved. There's also the Bible involved and faith, etc. Because people will look at things that be easily swayed by what is said or done by anybody. And again, I hope you're a little bit stubborn can be give people the wrong impression because I know the Bible says stubbornness is as the sin of witchcraft. I know it says that. So I hope you are a determined person who's not blown around with every wind of doctrine. And I hope you're not blown around with every report from a scientist. That Check the sciences. Check conflicting science reports. That's good to check things out. But don't be blown around because some people would just believe something because they've been taught, they've been dummied down about how to think and how to analyze. You say, exactly, Dave, someone would say, Dave, exactly who are you talking about? Anybody, everybody. Because any of us can make the mistake, but all of us should seek not to make the mistake. But the people, they're evil. For they said, make us gods that we should go before us as Moses and the man who brought us out of Egypt. We don't know what became of him. He's not back yet. So look at verse 24. This is the thing. I, I find it a little amusing. I don't know if I should find it amusing. Maybe I should find it sad. Maybe I should find it depressing. But I find it amusing. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave their gold to me. I threw it in the fire and this calf came out. That's not taking responsibility for what his part in it. I mean, that, that to me sounds like a teenager. It, it just happened. How, how, did this, how did that get broken? I don't know. It just happened. You know, it just, again, so we can, and sometimes, I wonder how many times we act so silly as well and act so foolish as well. And again, I, I don't want to judge Aaron. I think, actually, Aaron seems like a human being who helps me out when I do stupid things and helps me be kind toward you when you do stupid things. Sometimes we act just like Aaron. So again, the, the thing is, we don't want to blame other people. Carrying your own cross means quit blaming others. Let's not be victims. Let's take responsibility. Let's fight through the, even the adversity that comes, let's work our way through it responsibly. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Verse 40, uh, chapter 26, excuse me. Matthew chapter 26, verse 42. Now, even though you're to carry your own cross, I want to make the point that you can ask for help. Carrying the cross doesn't mean you have to do it all by yourself. You can ask for help. You're supposed to carry the cross, but you can ask for help. And the example, I, I probably don't need to cover this one because we covered it a lot during this, this season. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, asked help of his Father. O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Help me. Help me. I intend to make the right decision. I'm planning to make the right decision. I know what the right decision is, but the temptation is strong. My sorrow is heavy. The circumstances are rough. Help me, please. So even though you carry your own cross, it'd be most, not only is it permissible, it's appropriate to ask the father for help. Now, I guess sometimes when you're a dad, you sometimes when your child asks you for help, sometimes you say, no, you got to do that on your own. Did God ever do that? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There may have been that little instant when he said, You've got this, son. Just go through with it. You've got this. You've got this. You're prepared. You're committed. You've got this. But I would say many times, especially for us, when we ask God for help, we most certainly will receive his help and want his help, will accept his help. I want to look at a little scripture in Acts chapter 16, verse 3. It's a little scripture, but I just want to show you... The point I'm trying to make from this scripture, you can ask for help. Acts chapter 16, verse 3. 
here is right after the big conference of circumcision. They're going to announce the news of what they what the, all decided. They're announcing what the, the members are going to be doing, what the congregation of apostles and elders and the brethren decided. They're going to pass on what they're doing, how they viewed it, what they're going to be doing. Simple little words. Look at Acts 16, verse 3. Paul had come and found this guy named Timothy. And Timothy, he was the son of a certain Jewish woman who was a believer, but his dad was Greek. So I guess some people would say he came from a split family religiously. So if you happen to have been involved with a split family religiously, and you might think that's unfair, it's happened before, and God will help you through it. And while there are blessings to be with a united family from the same religion, there are certain there are certain things there are certain advantages of coming from a split family. You say, "Well, Dave, you're a, you're reaching for looking for the positive." Exactly, I'm always reaching to look for the positive. There are negatives to it, but there are some positives as well. But he, look at this: Paul wanted to have him go with him. I guess it's possible that Timothy said, "Hey, can I go with you?" And Paul just said, "Okay." Or it's possible that Paul approached him and said, would you come with me? You know, we'll find out in the the resurrection which one it is. And one makes my case stronger than the other. But I'm going to take the words, Paul wanted to have him go with him, meaning he wanted help. And either he accepted Timothy's offer or he asked for his help. And I just picked this out. Many examples you can look through the Bible where people helped each other. So again, again, this first point of carrying your own cross. We should not be blaming others, and it's okay to ask for help. The second main point in this sermon is Luke chapter 23, 26. Luke chapter 23, 26. And someone could accurately say, the overall sermon title of your sermon was long, but your two main points are short. The first point was Luke 14, 27. The second point was Luke 23, 30, 26, 23, 26. So again, my points are showing what the scripture says. And I chose it from Luke. You remember what we said last week. Now, as they laid him away, Christ, as they led him away, they laid a hold of a certain man, Simon, who was coming from his country. And on Simon, they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, I've I've said last week, and I'll say it again, to some people this poses a real problem, especially people who take the English words literally and don't look at various translations or don't sometimes look at the language. Sometimes people think this is a, a contradiction. He said, carry your own cross, but he didn't even carry his cross. That's the way some people could look at it. But that, this, this doesn't bother me at all. Because I I like to take the Bible for what it is, and I like to take the understanding of it, how it works together as it is. Yes, he told us to carry on cross, but actually it's encouraging to me that he had help carrying his. Which means that you and I can have help carrying ours. And it also means you and I can help other people carry theirs. And I think that's a big part of our religion is to help people carry their cross. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. How can you help people carry their cross? I have some, I actually have some things on the handout here. As you're turning to Matthew 25, verse 40. Let me give you some ways you can help people carry their cross. Time is a big thing. I hope these are practical. You can help people carry their cross when you pray for them. Time. You can help people carry their cross when you build a relationship with them. This was something really, really simple yesterday. It's real simple. Real simple. Uh, Neil and I, Neil MacGyver and I were standing outside talking for a while. I don't know how long we talked, 20 minutes, I don't know, half hour. The thing is, it was really a pleasant experience for me. Because I'm busy, and Neil's busy. And I really enjoyed the time just talking to him. We didn't solve the world's problems. We didn't attempt to solve the world's problems. We just talked. And as I came away thinking, boy, I I wish I could have more of that with just everybody in the congregation. Just to talk. 
because we get busy, get running at 90 miles an hour, time to continue your relationship, build on your relationship. Time, helping with a physical project, cutting wood together, moving somebody, uh, doing, helping them with their plumbing, helping them with their painting. Just time. Spend time together carrying the cross. Time listening. Boy, people need that. We need to listen. Sometimes we, we help. We hear their perspective. Even if we don't agree. Do we have the patience to hear someone's perspective telling us something we don't agree with and we're willing just to listen? Hearing their perspective, understanding their perspective. Sometimes you hear someone and you don't agree with them, but you don't get into a fight with them. And other times people talk to you because they want to know someone agrees with them. People like to know that what they're saying is logical. People like to know what they're saying is kind. So sometimes if you listen to someone, if you say, I understand what you're saying, that can really be a boost to somebody. Or that you tell them, you know, I agree with you on that. I think that's the way it should be. That can be a boost to somebody. You can help people as a bond of friendship. You can help people with an obstacle or a challenge. You can help people in a crisis. You can give guidance to people especially when it's invited. If someone when invited is saying, would you help me with this? What are your thoughts about that? How would you do this? You can give guidance. There's a time to give unsolicited advice, but be careful about that. Don't be one who goes around all the time giving people advice. But there's a time to give unsolicited advice to your friends. And notice I've been talking about time. But sometimes you help carry their cross with money, primarily for a need, primarily for a need. Sometimes you can give them money, a person money for a desire. Now you might say, Dave, I get it, giving money for someone's need. That makes sense. That's biblical. But why would you give money for a desire? Sometimes people are in a situation, like with kids, Sometimes you buy them something that's not really needful to encourage them, to love them. You say, Dave, are you saying that sometimes you treat a, an adult friend of yours like you would treat a child in that you, you would spend money on them in a not needful situation to encourage them? Yes. Yes. Some, even though most of the time should be a need, sometimes you spend money that's not the most needful thing. You know, of course, you only have so much money in your budget. But sometimes you might do something to encourage somebody. And you can pick up their spirits. i just give you some. You can think of other things about how you can help people carry your cross. But Matthew 25, 40 says, The king answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did this to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Do you carry the cross of the little people? Now, some people say, that sounds so horrible. That's a put down. Don't blame me. That's what it says in the Bible. He calls it the least of the brethren. I, I love helping little people as opposed to big shots. I love helping people who have needs as opposed. Oh, sometimes I get the chance. I, I, I've been around a few big shots in my time. And you know how I've helped them? Usually not with money because they don't need money. Actually, I've helped big shots by listening to them when they needed someone to talk to. And again, even big shots have needs. But Christ said, quoting verse 40, as you help the least of these, my brethren. So you can say, well, Dave, that makes sense. I look at you and I look at the people you hang around with. You try to help the little people. You look in society and try to help the people who need the help the most. We try to, but we all can do only do a little bit. But if we all do our little bit, if everyone in the body of Christ does our little bit, the body of Christ is doing its job because Christ has a job to do. He's the head of the, the church. He's the head of the body, and a lot gets done. But there's no one superhero. There's no one super group. 
There's no one super whatever. All of us in the body of Christ do our part to help the little people because we want to help carry the cross. Now, I'm not going to turn to Matthew chapter 4. That, that's a series I'll probably do sometime, like the wind series. If you analyze the three temptations of Christ, I'll do three separate series on that. But I don't, want, I don't have time to cover that today. I do want to go to Acts 9, though. Acts 9. Acts chapter 9. I, I find this really interesting here about helping people. Acts 9. There was a guy named Saul. Remember Saul on the road to Damascus? You remember that. Do you remember a guy named Barnabas? I gave, I gave a sermon on Barnabas years ago. It's one of my traveling sermons. I love talking about Barnabas. I love talking about the life of Barnabas. It's probably been 15 years since I've given it here. I can resurrect it sometime. I love talking about Barnabas. Let's talk about Saul here. Saul chapter 9 verse 22. <clears throat> Excuse me. Saul increased all the more in strength. He confounded the Jews who dwelt at Damascus because he proved to them that Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews wanted to kill him. They had a plot to kill him. Verse 24, Saul found out about their plot. They were watching the gates day and night to kill him. Okay. He did not deal with this all on his own. He had people carrying his cross. And you would have been there helping carry his cross. You would have been helping Saul. The disciples took him by night, put him down the wall in a large basket. Saul, we're putting you in this basket now. Now someone says, if you, if you trust God, you go out with a, a big glorious thing. You, you shouldn't be hiding. Friends, there's a time to hide. You're not hiding because you're a coward. You're hiding because you're smart. When you're down in that basket, you're hoping your stomach doesn't growl. Because you don't want to draw attention to the fact that you're escaping these Jews trying to kill you. And your friends have come up with a plan. <coughs> Excuse me. Either they've come up with a plan or they found the basket. Either they decided it was going to be a basket or they came up with a basket. And they said, we'll help you escape because we're looking out for you. And we're going to help carry your cross because they're trying to kill you. They're trying to get you. <clears throat> so then verse 26, his help didn't only, Barnabas' help wasn't only in, in there in the, in the area. He, that, look at down in, in the Jerusalem. When Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples there. But they were afraid of him because they didn't think he was a disciple. Confession. <clears throat> if, if someone's a real critic of the church of God and they walk through that door, it would take me a while to trust them. It would take me a while to trust them. That's, my, that's the way I'm made up. So I understand that. I would understand, uh, I want to kind of watch you a little bit before I trust you. That's what they were doing. But Barnabas took him, <coughs> excuse me, took him and took him to the apostles. But Barnabas said, let me take you to the apostles. People are not accepting you. People are not loving you. People are not wanting to be around you. And he was a guy of unity, a guy of peace, Barnabas. And he was helping carry the cross of his friend Saul. Now, I'm not going to turn to Romans 16. But Romans 16 has a list of people who helped Paul. I do want to conclude by looking at Hebrews chapter 6. Romans 16 is a list of people who helped Paul. They, he, they helped him. They were helped carry his cross. So he would write in his letters, thank you for helping me. Some names you're familiar with. Phoebe, Priscilla and Aquila. And there's probably about 12 other, I, can, I don't remember the exact number. I didn't count them for the sermon. There's about 12 others in that Romans 16. Men and women who he listed, who he trusted. He said, thank you for your helping me. And see, I believe that if people had a list of who, the, who was helping them, your name would be on the list. Now, your, our, my name may not be on all of your list, and your name may not be on everyone's list, but hopefully your name's on some of those lists. If someone said, who really helps me? You know you would find out there'd be people in this congregation 
You'd be find out there'd be people in other Church of God congregations. You'd find out there are people in Baptist congregations. People who really help you. And every Methodist congregations, Catholic congregations. <coughs> I talk about my friends. I talk about my Catholic acquaintance who helps sell tires to me. I talk about my car dealer friend who's a Pentecostal preacher. <coughs> I talk about different individuals who are, the, our religious differences are so different, but they would help me. And they help me help you. When I help you get a car, sometimes it's from a Pentecostal preacher who I happen to trust, who helps me carry my cross, who helps me carry your cross. And there are some Church of God people sprinkled in there, but I, where people go to church is not the key to helping. A kind heart, dedicated heart to God and to people, and those are the kind of people you know, and you have people like that. But more importantly, not only do you help people like that, you are people like that. You would be on a lot of lists of helping people. So I want to conclude with Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. <coughs> Find it here. God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. How have you shown love, a labor of love toward his name? By helping the saints. When you help people, you reflect the attitude of God. You reflect the mind of God. You reflect the heart of God. You carry the cross of family. You carry the cross of friends. You carry the cross of strangers. And you, you and I can only do so much. We don't, we're not the, the, we don't solve all the world's problems. But I occasionally solve this person's problem. I occasionally solve that couple's problem. I occasionally help that group's problem. Sometimes it's I help a family member. I love helping my family, even my extended family when I have opportunity. they living so far away. But we get to help each other. <coughs> Notice it says, you have ministered to them, and you do minister to them. Friends, you have helped many people to carry their cross. Please continue to help people to carry their cross.